Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. This week, we welcome Dr. Larry Brilliant, renowned epidemiologist credited with eradicating smallpox on COVID's next stand, the monkeypox threat, and the pandemic era we're now in. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. Our guest is a renowned epidemiologist and innovator who serves as the chair of the advisory board of Ending Pandemics, a nonprofit working to find outbreaks faster around the world. His expertise is a result of his success in helping the World Health Organization eradicate smallpox in the 1970s, the only disease the human race has eliminated. Dr. Larry Brilliant has a very appropriate last name. He is often referred to as Brilliant and by many other complimentary adjectives. He's been recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people, has led public companies and startups. He's an author, received four honorary doctorates, and currently serves on a number of foundation boards of directors. Well, Dr. Brilliant, welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. I'm very happy to be with you. You know, it's Immunization Awareness Month, and we have a lot to go over on that topic. You have praised the WHO for declaring monkeypox a global health emergency, and you believe ring vaccination approach is needed as New York State, San Francisco, where you're out nearby, uh, have declared it as an emergency situation. I'm wondering if you could uh, unpack that for our listeners and give us the details of how a ring vaccination strategy would work. I think I think my praise uh, was tempered. My my exact comment was better late than never, which m- might be WHO's nickname. Better late than never. Um, we should have taken action when there were a hundred cases or a thousand cases. Today there are over twenty thousand cases. We now sadly have three deaths to report: uh, two in Spain, uh, one in an immunocompromised person. We don't know the status of the second one in Brazil. During this period, there have also been five deaths from monkeypox in the two endemic regions in Africa. Um, that, that alone should make us say that this is a emergency, a disease of international concern. What I'm most worried about, however, is that these two spots of endemicity, um, one in Congo, one in West Africa, with two different clades of the virus, what I'm most concer- concerned about is that those two areas of endemicity could balloon up to a hundred or a thousand, and then in every large city we might have endemic monkeypox. And let me explain why that is. First of all, smallpox is not a disease of smalls, and monkeypox is not a disease of monkeys. Uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different orthopox viruses. Many of them, like cowpox, can infect dozens of different species. And the virus, which is called monkeypox, is probably predominantly a rodent infection. We don't really know what its original host animal is, but it is certainly capable of infecting hamsters, prairie dogs, giant gambian pouch rodents, and regular urban rats. If we have so many cases of human monkeypox virus and we allow it to grow unchecked, that's like giving Steph Curry unlimited shots on on goal, Mm. and he will make most of them. What I worry about is that number of replications will lead to so many mutations that the virus may take on much worse clinical characteristics, might become endemic in um, our urban sewers and urban rodent population, squirrel population. And as it bounces back and forth, spilling over and spilling back, we don't know what this virus will do. Um, I have a, a small group of friends that I'm part of, the, the smallpox warriors we call ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, it's a dwindling group, but there's a lot of concern. Could this virus, over time, with enough shots on goal, mutate into something that resembles smallpox, heaven forbid. Um, and, and that's where the ring vaccination comes from, Mark. Um, mm-hmm. The original vaccine against smallpox is extremely effective against monkeypox. Um, I've seen numbers of 85 or 90 percent. In the case of that vaccine against smallpox, it was close to 95, 100 percent. It's a very effective vaccine. 
because it was so effective, because the world feared smallpox so much before, it, in the immediate period before it was eradicated, smallpox killed half a billion people, 300 million to 500 million in the 20th century alone. One out of three people who contracted it died from it. And the way that we were able to eradicate it was by following a unique strategy conceived of by Bill Fagey, who then was working on the smallpox program, became the head of CDC. And that was to find every case of smallpox in the world at the same time and to draw a, a ring of immunity around each case. And that ring was not just geographic, it was sociometric, by right? investigating the index case by doing forward and backward tracing, uh, words that we've come to learn about from COVID, but in reality, they have a much deeper meaning than the simple way of, uh, of thinking about just contact tracing. We were able to immunize all those people who might next get smallpox until there were no more uh, susceptible hosts around. And that's how we eradicated smallpox. We could do the same thing with monkeypox now. If we wait much longer, it will be too late. Once it's endemic in rodents all over the world, um, I, I, I'd, I'd not like to believe that we would bequeath our, our children and our grandchildren a world like that, Mark. Hmm. Well, Dr. Brilliant, I think you just gave our listeners a lot to think about there. And I wonder uh, if I can ask you, what's your assessment of how uh, ready and capable we are throughout the country, either states operating independently or as part of a coordinated strategy uh, with CDC to implement this ring approach. And, and I'll put that in the context uh, that uh, in our own state of Connecticut, uh, certainly one of the smaller states, but as of today, I think Mark 15 or 20 community clinics, of which we have uh, six of them, have a uh, vaccine on hand uh, to be used in the appropriate uh, situations. And, and certainly very much tied to uh, the public health department really uh, identifying the positive cases and making sure that they do contact tracing and, and that those vaccines are pretty readily available in facilities and organizations that people are likely to be able to access. Uh, do you think that's part of the state health departments already having launched this ring approach? What do you see happening across the country in the U.S. right now? I don't think we're very well prepared. I don't think that CDC has uh, mounted as energetic a response as I would like to see. Scott Gottlieb, uh, the former head of the FDA, has a op-ed in today's New York Times, I believe, uh, saying that if we don't act quickly, this will become the most abysmal public health failure in memory. There's a lot of other competitions for that throne, so that would be something. Um, you, you know, I think that part of the reticence, um, and, and I attended a couple of the WHO uh, advisory committees on, um, on monkeypox, part of the reticence is that we, we have um, an approved vaccine that works against smallpox and monkeypox, that works both before you're exposed and after. I'd like to come back to that. that that's something we call PEP, post-exposure mm -hmm. prophylaxis. If you're using it as a post-exposure prophylaxis, the question you, we might ask, should it be regulated as a vaccine or should it be regulated as a therapeutic? And uh, I, I would like to come back to that because a big difference in the amount of vaccine we have available to us if we regulate it as a treatment as opposed to a prophylaxis. But the, I think I said prophylaxis, I meant therapeutic. Um, so uh, if, if we think of this as something where you're vaccinating people and the risk is low, like the vaccines that we use for childhood immunization, then the bar has got to be very high. Uh, no side effects of any major consequence, rare side effects at all. If you're using this as something in the middle of an epidemic or a pandemic that's going to save lives immediately, then the bar is a little bit lower. And so we, the vaccines that we have that are specific for monkeypox, they are um, mostly without many side effects. The old smallpox vaccine, which we're calling Drybacks, 
<laughs> that we used to use by <clears throat> distributing it almost like freeze-dried coffee <clears throat> in little vials and then reconstituting it in the field and then using a bifurcated needle and a couple of, uh, I'll show my arm here, and, and a, a couple of uh, inner dermal um, uh, pokes with a bifurcated needle. That vaccine has, to me, a very low number of, of side effects. But it is true that that would be an unacceptably high number of side effects were it not that this was an emergency. And, and those are the things I think WHO has been wrestling with. Um, and because I'm concerned about this long-term possibility of monkeypox becoming endemic in um, animal populations all over the world, I would be in favor of using more vaccine more quickly. And we just don't have enough of it right now um, to vaccinate everybody. So and I think in fairness to WHO and CDC, those are the things that they've been wrestling with. Um, I think I would have taken a much more aggressive position, but but I may be in the minority because I've seen so much death from smallpox. <laughs> you know, you sort of give low grades to WHO. Gottlieb uh, criticizes uh, Congress maybe around the CDC and, and implicitly the CDC. Just trying to think back over the last couple of decades, we've had SARS and swine flu and MERS, COVID-19, now monkeypox. Maybe Marburg is on the horizon there. Who, who knows? What's your global sense of this early warning system? Is it just building on these two organizations, uh, obviously the Europeans and others? Do it. What, what's the larger strategy? Because we were talking and been interviewing people during the COVID-19, something else is coming, something else is coming, be ready. Everyone should be forewarned. Don't, don't be casual about uh, what's, what's around the corner. What's our state of readiness in your mind? First of all, I give very high grades to WHO uh, for doing what it's supposed to do as a regulatory agency, as an agency that sets standards, despite having the world's worst organizational structure, N not the fault of the current administration of WHO, but the idea that uh, WHO has to rule by consensus of 100 countries meeting once a year, has a regional structure where all the power and money is in the regions, but the responsibility is at the center. Um, bo both of these agencies, WHO and CDC, are, are a bit long in the tooth from their original um, structures. Um, you know, I've written uh, a lot about entering an age of pandemics. Um, my colleagues and I in foreign affairs a couple of years ago, wrote an article about COVID, and we called it the forever virus. Those sound like very pessimistic titles for articles, but they're actually quite optimistic, um, because if you identify those problems, then you can do something about it, Mark. Uh, and Margaret, if you don't identify them and you don't name them for what they are, COVID is a forever virus. We are in an age of pandemic. That doesn't mean that we should hide or live in fear. Um, I think there's something like 1,400 recognized uh, zoonotic viruses that can infect human beings. Maybe it's more than that now. Um, that doesn't mean we live in fear of the environment that we're in. It means we understand what we need to do to identify those pathogens that are in animals that will jump or can jump to humans that do create illness or death. And we prioritize our, that part of our health system. That's not the cancer control part of our health system, the stroke part of our health system, but this part of our health system. And it needs to be permanent. In the, the middle of a huge forest fire like we have in Northern California right now is not the time to start thinking about what the paint on the, on the fire engine should look like or how many people should be sitting in the fire department. It has to be there all the time. That's what Benjamin Franklin taught us. The fire department's got to be there all the time. And we are in the midst of a fire of new uh, pandemic potential diseases, more so than ever. Um, I think we had a, a kind of sweet interlude between uh, the Spanish flu of 1918 and COVID. We had two other small pandemics, each with a, a million deaths. That, that's what small is in the pandemic world. Um, 
But that doesn't mean it's going to be another 100 years before we have another catastrophic pandemic. And, and why is that? Well, because human population is going all over the globe, because we're cutting down rainforests, because we're, we've created climate change that have made animals from the south move to the north and spread their viruses and mingle their viruses with other like species. It's because the human-animal interface has been broken. And when you le live in the same uh, uh, ecosystem as animals, you will share viruses with them. And we're seeing with monkeypox uh, a virus that can spread over, spill over from uh, animal to an animal to a human, and then spill back, as we saw in, in 2003 with an epidemic of monkeypox in Minnesota that began in Texas with the importation of exotic animals and led to a small but important epidemic of monkeypox in prairie dogs, which were being kept as pet, pets, and humans got it from the prairie dogs. We've seen with mink in Denmark that mink farmers were able to give COVID to the mink and then mink give it to humans so much so that we had to wipe out that industry. I think that we sacrificed, which means killed, um, 17, 20,000 mink. And so, so we, we're living in that world in part because of Moderna, in large part because of modernity. Modernity means we have rapid transportation, a, a virus that jumps from an animal to a human, a bird flu epidemic that begins in Laos or Cambodia among chickens or among ducks that is transferred and humans uh, contract that disease. That, that disease can be around the world in, in hours. So, so we need to rethink what we're doing. There's a good conversation going on in the world about a pandemic treaty that would elevate our requirements uh, on how to deal with pandemics to the level of a treaty organization. There have been very good conversations of um, lots of scientists mm -hmm. putting a, a ring around the world of high performance sequencing labs that uh, help with the early detection or early specification of the virus. I'm optimistic that there's enough interest beyond just WHO and CDC, but certainly including them. Um, if you add Gavi and if you add uh, the FAO and you look at CORDS, I can give you an alphabet soup mm -hmm. of acronyms of really good organizations that are working very hard. But we need Congress to take this seriously. Uh, there's been a bill that was uh, uh, stalled for $18 billion to go to pandemic preparedness. Now the Biden administration, which we all want to have succeed, wants to take away these um, uh, duties from CDC and bring it into an office. That's what Scott Gottlieb's article is hinting at. Uh, and take it, the Assistant Secretary for Prevention, ASPR, and turn that into an agency like, like CDC. We need to have a national conversation about how important these communicable diseases are that are primarily, but not exclusively, jumping from animals. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, we've got antibiotic resistance organ and antibiotic resistant organisms that have been held in check by antibiotics, and these antibiotics are not working anymore, and there's very few new ones in the pipeline. But this is not to scare people. This is just to say we can, mm -hmm. we can do anything we want if there's public will, but there can't be public will without public trust, and there can't be public trust right. without a conversation like this. Well, Dr. Brilliant, I think uh, what you've uh, just laid out should be mandatory listening or reading for people to understand this world that we're living in, how we're responding to it, and how we want to think about the response going forward. And we do have this sense uh, as uh, we go about the work of healthcare and public health of uh, community fatigue, right? Listening fatigue, if you will, to some of this. And in the midst of all of it, we now have as our next, you know, little hurdle on the landscape, uh, the announcement by the Biden administration that uh, next month we expect to have reformulated COVID booster shots available that are expected to hold up better against the now dominant Omicron subvariant uh, BA5. Wonder what's your view on this? Is this a big step forward? Is it possible to avoid a winter surge as people grapple with the big issues? This next one seems right in front of us. 
Well, as much a fan as I am of the miracle uh, of the mRNA vaccines, <clears throat> um, they're not the right vaccines to stop people from getting COVID or to stop people from giving COVID. They don't have, um, they don't produce very much mucosal immunity or IgA. Um, we need intranasal vaccines for that because they require such deep refrigeration. They don't travel very well. It's hard to get to the 2 billion or 3 billion human beings that WHO uh, classify as being outside of the reach of public health systems around the world. Um, I'm, I'm cheered by hearing about work being done now to prioritize these um, intranasal vaccines. So the mRNA vaccine new iterations that are coming out are improvements at the margin, but they're not dramatic improvements. Um, I'm not so sure that the, uh, that the new vaccines that will come out in September or October or whenever they are uh, approved by the FDA and made available, I'm not so sure that they will be that effective against BA4 and BA5. I hope they will be. Uh, they're going to be, from what I understand, um, they're going to have two different antigens, one for the original, um, the original COVID and then one for Omicron. But the Omicron that they're targeted against can't possibly be BA5 because we haven't had it long enough. So what I've heard, at least, is that it's just going to be the original Omicron. If that's the case, I hope they're going to be effective. Uh -huh. I'd rather see a BA5 specific vaccine. But if you do that, you're going to be playing whack-a-mole because right. it's what's going to happen with the next variant. Um, much better, I think, would be to work on intranasal vaccines that prevent you from getting the whole family of COVID, not just on vaccines that try to catch up with the next variant. That being said, I'm going to stand in line to get it Good. <laughs> because it's, a, it's certainly an improvement and an incremental one. Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Brilliant, let me let me turn to the environment. You know, the Senate uh, over the weekend announced uh, uh, one would hope on a historic agreement uh, between uh, Schumer and Manchin, uh, and it would make uh, about four hundred billion dollars worth of investments towards combating climate change. And you're senior counsel at Scholl Foundation, which is a very strong focus on mobilizing climate action. What difference will this law hope if it passes the Senate and the House mean to for health, uh, the health of Americans, and uh, how can it deliver on its promise? Oh, it's huge. M Mark, y you probably feel as I do <clears throat> that there's a category of modern risks that are difficult to articulate. And climate change is an odorless, invisible, tasteless gas in the air, and people can't believe that it's changing the climate. And so long as we did nothing in the United States, the rest of the world will, will do still look to us. They, they, they're not going to do things. India is not going to do things to stop climate. China is going to do less unless we play our role. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's so many people around the world who say the industrial countries have created this mess. Let them clean it up. And if we were absent at the table, if we were not part of the Paris Agreement, if we were not working on cutting carbon emissions, having targets that we meet, that leadership would be gone. And, um, and then I think what we do is we all sit around and say, well, this is inevitable. Maybe it'll happen in 50 years. For gosh sakes, just look around you. It's happening today. Look at the floods in Virginia, the historic floods in Virginia. Look at the wildfires all over the West. Look at the great drought in the West. Look at hurricanes last season, gathering much more steam because of the uh, superheated uh, water that creates these superstorms. We are in the middle of climate change right now. We're not early. We're in the middle of it right now. And this law, while it's a small amount of money compared to what we need, it is catalytic. I can't over I can't overstate how important it is mm -hmm. and how thrilled and surprised I was to see it. By the way, there's a similar bill that Pat Leahy, Senator Pat Leahy from your neck of the woods, yep. uh, has proffered. Uh, and that's specifically for uh, stopping um, on, and for creating agencies to work on pandemic preparedness. And I hope that that bill gets the same attention because we need that just as much.
It was a bit of good news and uh, a sometimes seemingly endless uh, not so good news. But I'm going uh, to ask you to look into your futurist ball maybe for a moment. You are known for the development of the well, a virtual community that you started way back in the ancient days of 1985 that's been called a precursor of every online business from Amazon to eBay. So I'd like you to look into your futurist crystal ball and say, what's in the future for healthcare in in terms of the metaverse? Is there a purposefulness there that can be captured for the betterment of people and healthcare? <laughs> um, I haven't thought very much about that. Um, I, I do think there's some things that you can do virtually uh, as training programs that are extraordinarily helpful. Um, but I, I actually w wish that we wouldn't spend so much time thinking about the metaverse and we think much more about the universe that we live in. Um, there's so much more work to do, Margaret, on, on the fundamentals, on honesty and transparency and trust and, dare I say, love that, mm -hmm. that we've forgotten about. Uh, you can't get good at the metaverse if you're not good at the universe. And, and I think we've, all of us, if we're honest, the last couple of years have forced us to do some soul searching, and we failed a lot. Um, my friend Bill Fagey, who I spoke about earlier, my mentor, is working on a, on a program called How to Be a Great Ancestor. Hmm. I, I, I think that just thinking about that, how, how do we become a great ancestor, uh, whether you're dealing with bequeathing a healthcare system that's functional and working and that we don't have anyone who's not covered by health insurance um, or whether you're thinking about how do we put in place the, the stop gaps to prevent the worst excesses of climate change or pandemics or drought or famine which we are on the cusp of in so many places around the world um, you know let, let me shift focus shift on that not the metaverse i'd be happier Okay. <laughs> no, I think we Sorry, all would Mark. be. No, let me shift gears a little bit. You know, the Biden administration has announced plans for legal uh, psychedelic therapies within two years. And you've been talking about this for years. Uh, why do you think it's taken so long? And what do you think about the prospects of, uh, of its approval? So I, I'd like to pay some homage to my friend, uh, Dr. Richard Rockefeller, who passed away a couple of years ago. He was really the progenitor of a lot of this research. Uh, uh, he was also the head of the chairman of the Rockefeller Foundation and mm -hmm. the chairman of Doctors Without Borders, a psychiatrist who gave so much to the world. And one of the things he did, helping to create maps and all these other organizations and having the actual uh, peer reviewed prospective cohort studies done that have allowed the FDA to approve some psychedelics uh, for use in individual clinical care, um, I think that's a big step forward. I don't know where it will go. Um, uh, I know I came out of the 60s when psychedelics had a very different meaning and purpose and were much more intertwined with uh, our youthful life. Um, but I, I personally know a lot of people who have been treated in a psychiatric session um, with legal uh, psychedelics, mm -hmm. and they report tremendous results. Um, I've heard that some people have been treated for PTSD coming out of the Iraq war mm -hmm. in a single session. Yeah and have achieved great insight. So uh, it's, it's not my area of specialty. Um, I'm an epidemiologist, so I'm looking for the data that will come out of it. But um, I, I guess I'm a cheerleader for anything that can work with, uh, John Stewart reminds me, at, uh, with our wounded veterans who uh, gave everything uh, to fight in Iraq and Afghanistan and have come back wounded with PTSD. And I, I, I'm, in that sense, I'm really optimistic and hopeful. Dr. Brilliant, we can see why Fast Company stated there are a few who have had more impact on the world than you have. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks to our audience as well. You can learn more about conversations on healthcare or sign up for our updates at www.chcradio.com. Dr. Brilliant, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your thoughts today. Thank you for inviting me and, and thanks so much for your patience and for the good work that you, you guys do. Oh, that's Thank you great. so much. And you're a real inspiration. We'll continue to follow your work. And again, thanks for taking the time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.